currently the company is uh, called OIL, Orient Overseas International Limited, which is a holding company listed in Hong Kong. But the company itself is uh, substantially controlled by the family. The family owns about 67 percent of the house shares of the company. Then the balance, 33 percent or so, is uh, uh, in the public hands. I came back to Hong Kong, worked at the company uh, in the capacity of uh, vice chairman, mm -hmm. and in 1997, I think, then I took over as chairman as chief executive. It's interesting if you look at look back into the history. Uh, if you look at the last sort of milestone was the Second World War. You know? Right after the war, the, glo uh, the global economy was in the recovery mode. And if you look at consumer goods, which container shipping carries, uh, if we take 1950s, right, most of the con consumer goods were manufactured in North America, in Europe, in the so-called more advanced state uh, e uh, economies. Uh, and therefore, uh, with the growth of economy, consumption starts to take up, uh, consumer goods flow from the the so-called industrialized country to the developing country or underdeveloping country and of course amongst the developed country as well and then the first change came with Japan you know. Japan's economy started to grow they become uh, a manufacturing center again because of lower cost base so a lot of activities which was undertaken in North America, in Europe, actually principally North America moved to Japan. And more and more goods are being purchased from Japan. Japan were able to manufacture cheaper goods. Japan were able to improve their manufacturing technique and improve the consumer products, you know, which encompass from very cheap end, evolve all the way to very expensive home electronics and so on and so forth, which I think you actually the through. And then Japan become more expensive. What happened is then the four dragons took place. Uh, moving to Taiwan, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Singapore. You know. And that happened probably in the early 70s. And these are the, again, take, uh, uh, taking over from Japan the part that is more labor intense. And this four little dragons provides, again, a alternative for a lower cost manufacturing. And then with the four dragons, you see the opening of China in the 70s, early 80s. And the first action is factory owners and capitals in Hong Kong start investing in China, moving the factories and hence starts uh, the China manufacturing cycle. And of course, with such a large labor pool in China, it, it attracted a lot of investment from North America, from later on Europe, uh, but principally a lot of Hong Kong money, Singapore money, uh, Taiwan money. And then of course, Japan, Korea, you know, all moved into China. Not only because of low cost labor, but also it's a developing economy. It's a it's consum consumption the uh, consumer market. So. Mm -hmm. so this is the history yeah. so far up to now. Mm -hmm. And then, if you will project, you will already see some of the lower cost item is now moving away from China to Bangladesh, to uh, Vietnam, to perhaps Burma and so on and so forth. So generally speaking, the consumer goods, you can track them from the 50s, 
from North America to Japan to the Four Dragons to China now to Southeast Asia you know, countries. And how do we do that? And let's look back again uh, in the growth of the economy, global economy. And if you look at trade, I can give you a very interesting statistic known very commonly in our industry but not so much outside. For the longest time, our trade container volume, you know, with goods, we were growing at about 8% average each year for 30, 40 years, you know, all the way up to 2002, you know, and the break comes when China uh, joins WTO. First year 2002. From 2002 to the year 2008, you have uh, a higher growth. We were looking at perhaps uh, 10, 11, 12 percent. So that was the history of you know trade growth. Yeah. Uh, and how do we achieve that apart from uh, the world? economic growth, we have actually able to, in our industry, able to provide transportation cheaper and cheaper and yet cheaper, you know, through, first of all, the containerization. The containerization really revolutionized the handling of goods. Instead of parcel, bale, you know, boxes being moved by hand, you consolidate into a box, and the box is moved by machineries. You know. And then it would be transported by trucks you know, in the entire box unit. So that actually reduces the cost on a unit basis. And then from that point onwards, we were able to containerize not only consumer goods, but also semi-finished goods. Even some raw material, you know, uh, and of course, during the boom year, we were actually shipping grain products in containers as well. So, uh, the competition within our industry, you know, uh, forces us to become more efficient. Inevitably, we pass a good part of the saving. Uh, to the consumer. So that actually helped the movement of goods. Mm -hmm. For instance, I think typically quoted statistic is that finished goods, whether it be rebound shoes, you know, or uh, a bottle of Johnny Walker whiskey, uh, on the average, the transportation costs, ocean transportation costs, as well as the land transportation costs, to the shop is about 3% of total sales price. Mm -hmm. So this is really a very efficient supply chain. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm sure our industry would continue to be provide uh, uh, through competition would actually provide even more costly transportation, uh, cheaper transportation. Mm -hmm. You know, costs uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. So that that is a sort of a summary of what yeah. <laughs> we've gone through. Shipping is part of global trading, yeah. and our concern has always been: we don't worry about the uh, economic down cycle because you know if you manage it well, you know it always allows you a chance to grow even you know, more in a more sustainable fashion in the future. Because we had the structural problem, we need to deal with the structural problem. Once that is overcome, then we will see a long period of sustained growth again. But during the adjustment, what we worry is, you know, the politician would be looking for a more expedient way of doing it. And then they would probably resort to, you know, uh, protectionism. And that is a concern we have. Protectionism uh, sometimes very often prolongs the 
you know, necessary uh, adjustment you know, to the system. Uh, and if it takes uh, to the extreme, it may kill the economy, so to speak. So that, that is a concern we have. So in the sense that, you know, the, uh, in our industry, we have a lot of different platforms in, you know, uh, speaking out, you know, uh, we will be actually trying to give the message. The global trade is an important part of the global economy. You know, and we need to continue to preach the free trade, you know, the, uh, 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 condition that we see today you know, and in fact we've seen the improvement over the years you know, under WTO structure, multilateral and so on uh, we should continue to promote it. Mm -hmm. only through trade you can promote global economy we, we try to be more efficient you know. through efficiency we can compete you know. because of competition you know, uh, you can then, you know, the, uh, allow trade and supply chain to work, yeah. and ultimately, you know, the benefit will be shared between all the stakeholders. So, uh, we are facing challenging time, and yet we felt that competition is necessary to survive even, you know, for us. So we will continue to invest in what we need to invest. Uh, we are also joining the uh, companies that have actually taken action of investing in larger ships so that you can gain further efficiency. You know. uh, with difficult time, luckily we're quite, you know, a healthy company. We have a strong balance sheet. And we decided to also continue to invest. Invest in larger unit ships uh, and then selling off less efficient ships, which very often we have to take a loss. So there is a structure change in our own business as well. We have to accept you know, our responsibility and play our role and make our contribution towards the society. I think education is very important. <clears throat> And Asia is still a developing region, so we tend to do more in Asia. But we do likewise in the North America. In the U.S., we have a very uh, robust uh, internship program, you know, that we take in the students to come and spend some you know, internship. I think we do, and I, I, I will tell you another project that we, you know, sort of reflect this uh, particular statement. We were, for a long time, uh, supporter and the driver for a project. I think you might have heard of it. It's called Semester and Semester at Sea yeah. program. You know, and we started this organization which drives this project forward. It's Institute for Shipboard Education. Way back in the seventies, you know, we started with uh, Chapman College in uh, California, in Los Angeles then moved to the uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, and then the Pittsburgh University. And then ultimately, we believe the organization is mature enough. You know, I think in the mid-90s, we worked with the management of the institution for shipboard education that they should take over as an independent uh, institution. So they have done so. Uh, currently, this program is uh, in collaboration with uh, uh, Virginia University. So the concept behind it, my father started, the concept behind it is that, you know, we need to, you know, the, uh, education is so important, but we need to allow students to understand different culture, different heritage, yeah. that would improve their understanding of the world yeah, the, as they grow up, as they enter mm -hmm. the uh, society. Yeah. So that that is something that we always, you know, believe in, and therefore we also, you know, because we are a very international company, you know, 
and it reflects in uh, people that works in the organization. We have many, many uh, officers. I think we have about 150 officers who are in 50 odd countries. And our operating uh, philosophy is that when we go to a country, we must, you know, the, uh, use and employ local talents. So, if you you're from Germany, we we're very active in Germany, Germany, and our headman is a German, and everybody is German, you know. <laughs> but we work very closely together, you know, the, and particularly with internet, you know, the communication uh, is good, sharing of knowledge is good, you know. Uh, we in fact use uh, social media now internally, and we actually invite our customer you know, and our vendor to join our social media. You know. We have a private social media <laughs> so that you know, we can talk about the problem, we talk about the issues. You know. Uh, it, it, you know, although granted it is more business related, you know, but at least it is a big family sharing. Uh, that is really the, you know, the culture for the company. And it, because it is international in nature, it become a global family mm -hmm. that works for OCR.